Hello everyone, it's Dr Hurst again, Sam or Holly as you prefer. Today I'm doing another read along for Romancing the Gothic, although you're always welcome to join me for my reads. Um, and today we're going to be doing William ba Beckford's Vathic. Um, again it's another novel so we're just doing some extracts from it and we're going to have a little bit of a chat about where it fits into the early British Gothic. Um, it's a really fascinating text, incredibly lush, rich prose, an exaggerated, um, fantastical, surreal use of the supernatural. Um, and I hope that you will enjoy it with me. So, oh, let me tell you where I am. I've moved because I was trying to get better lighting, um, but it's all a little bit mute, uh, moot at this point uh, because I have had to re-record re this so many times. Um, because I've made so many mistakes that um, the daylight has gone anyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is my library. Um, it's not quite Beauty and the Beast, is it? But um, it'll do for me with its mismatched second-hand bookcases. Um, it's also my second bedroom, so I've got a little fold-out bed in the corner there. <laughs> so why are we doing Vathic? In part because um, I think that quite a lot of people aren't necessarily familiar with it. It's not one of the most well-known of the early Gothics. And that's in part because we have this slightly distorting narrative, I think, about how the Gothic developed. And we tend to sort of kick it into um, a fairly sort of linear um, narrative. This idea that we had the castle of Otranto and then we have Clara Reeve and the old English Baron and she's saying yes I love your idea, I love the project, combining the old and the new romance, but your supernatural's out there man, we need to rein it back in. Um, and so she just has a, a vengeful ghost um, back within the realm of probability or possibilities. Um, what she tries to do. And then you have this development through the Radcliffian Gothic, for example. You have this interest in the explained supernatural. So, you know, you're there, you're hearing some noises at night, you're seeing a, a candle in the, the window of the abandoned wing. What could it be? Ghost? Cursed? No, it's your mum. She's been locked in the cellar for 20 years. That's what it is. Um, so that sort of gothic and then this bifurcation into that gothic continuing as the terror gothic and the horror gothic of um, writers such as Matthew Lewis in The Monk where you have the real supernatural again and you have this confrontation with real horrors all the time. You're tripping over dead bodies every other page. Um, and so that's the, the narrative of the development of the gothic that we quite often have but it, it's obviously oversimplistic any narrative like that where it's very clearly a line we're like mm, that's probably cutting some bits off of course it is um, and there are a couple of different offshoots of the gothic that um, occurred in the 18th century because remember we're experimenting in the creation of a new genre here um, that didn't necessarily take off at the time although it would later um, so there's things like The Recess by Sophia Lee which is one of the earliest historical novels before Walter Scott and it tells the story of the two imaginary daughters of Mary Queen of Scots who are raised in isolation in The Recess, an ecclesiastical space beneath the grounds of the family home. And um, then you also have like the philosophical gothic for example of William Godwin with St Leon, Caleb Williams, Mandeville. Um, he does fascinating things with narrative voice, does William Godwin. So I definitely recommend um, having a look at Mandeville, um, one of the first first person narratives from the per point of view of a, an anti-hero. It's really fascinating. Um, and, but you also have the Orientalist Gothic of Vathek. Of course this isn't a dead end completely, it, it comes back and there's certainly different manifestations of this interest in mixing the Gothic with um, exoticized Eastern cultures later on in the um, the 19th century as well. Um, of course you've got the examples of um, sort of the African Gothic there and the Egyptian Gothic with all of the mummies and things like the Beetle by Richard Marsh, that sort of thing. Um, but this is a sort of early example of it and we can trace back uh, this sort of oriental aspect to the beginning of the 18th century and the first publication or the first translation into English of the Arabian Nights and it started this whole kind of fad, this trend for the, the Arabian um, and 
William Beckford incorporates these elements into his uh, partially gothic novel. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about um, how different narratives are combined, so different ideas of, for example, Islamic belief and mythology are combined with Christian iconography, and also a quick little word about the issue of Orientalism before I leave you. But for now, we're going to get straight into reading. Um, I'm going to read you a passage from near the end at which, um, in which the Caliph Vathek, um, he's been cutting a swath um, across the countryside basically at this point. He's totally given himself over to pleasure and flesh and corruption. He's renounced the prophet, he's renounced his god and he's in this search for profane knowledge and power um, that's been sort of uh, promoted by his mother but he's also been tempted by this Gior who is also another character that we're going to meet in the moment. He also, on his journeys, picked up a bride. He already had a lot, but this is the first one he's ever really loved, Naranaha. Um, and she left her father's home, tempted by the thought of power and riches and iniquity. So I'm going to read to you um, from their entrance into the halls of Eblis. I'm not going to read right to the end. I'm not going to spoil it. The gait of these impious personages was haughty and determined. As they descended by the effulgence of the torches, they gazed on each other with mutual admiration, and both appeared so resplendent that they already esteemed themselves spiritual intelligences. The only circumstances that perplexed them was their not arriving at the bottom of the stairs. On hastening their descent with an ardent impetuosity, they felt their steps accelerated to such a degree that they seemed not walking but falling from a precipice. Their progress, however, was at length impeded by a vast portal of ebony, which the caliph without difficulty recognised. Here the Gior awaited them with a key in his hand. You're welcome, said he to them with a ghastly smile, in spite of Mohammed and all his dependents. I will now admit you into the palace where you have so highly merited a place. Whilst he was uttering these words, he touched the enamelled lock with his key and the doors at once expanded, with a noise still louder than the thunder of mountains, and as suddenly recoiled the moment they had entered. The Caliph and Nuranaha beheld each other with amazement, at finding themselves in a place which, though roofed with a vaulted ceiling, was so spacious and lofty that at first they took it for an immeasurable plain. But their eyes at length growing familiar to the grandeur of the objects at hand, they extended their view to those at a distance and discovered rows of columns and arcades, which gradually diminished till they terminated in a point, radiant as the sun when he darts his last beams athwart the ocean. The pavement, strewed over with gold dust and saffron, exhaled so subtle an odour as almost overpowered them. They, however, went on, and observed an infinity of senses in which ambergus and the wood of aloes were continually burning. Between the several columns were placed tables, each spread with a profusion of viands, and wines of every species sparkling in vases of crystal. A throng of genie and other fantastic spirits of each sex danced lasciviously at the sound of music which issued from beneath. In the midst of this immense hall, a vast multitude was incessantly passing, who severally kept their right hands on their hearts, without once regarding anything around them. They had all the livid paleness of death, their eyes, deep sunk in their sockets, resembled those phosphoric meteors that glimmer by night in the places of internment. Some stalked slowly on, absorbed in profound reverie. Some, shrieking with agony, ran furiously about, like tigers wounded with poisoned arrows. Whilst others, grinding their teeth in rage, foamed along, more frantic than the wildest maniac. They all avoided each other, and though surrounded by a multitude that no one could number, each wandered at random, unheedful of the rest, as if alone on a desert which no foot had trodden. Vathik and Naranaha, frozen with terror to sight so baleful, demanded of the Geo what these appearances might mean, and why these ambulating spectres never withdrew their hands from their hearts. Perplex not yourself with so much at once, replied he bluntly. You will soon be acquainted with all. Let us haste and present you to Eblis. 
They continued their way through the multitude, but notwithstanding their confidence at first, they were not sufficiently composed to examine with attention the various perspectives of halls and of galleries that opened on the right hand and left, which were all illuminated by torches and braziers, whose flames rose in pyramids to the centre of the vault. At length they came to a place where long curtains, brocaded with crimson and gold, fell from all parts in striking confusion. Here the choirs and dances were heard no longer. The light which glimmered came from afar. After some time, Vathak and Naranahar perceived a gleam brightening through the drapery and entered a vast tabernacle carpeted with the skins of leopards. An infinity of elders with streaming beards and afrits in complete armour had prostrated themselves before the ascent of a lofty eminence, on the top of which, upon a globe of fire, sat the formidable Eblis. His person was that of a young man, whose noble and regular features seemed to have been tarnished by malignant vapours. In his large eyes appeared both pride and despair. His flowing hair retained some resemblance to that of an angel of light, and in his hand which thunder had blasted, he swayed the iron sceptre that causes the monster Oranabad, the Afrits, and all the powers of the abyss to tremble. At his presence the heart of the caliph sank within him, and for the first time he fell prostrate on his face. Nuranahar, however, though greatly dismayed, could not help admiring the person of Eblis, for she expected to have seen some stupendous giant. Eblis, with a voice more mild than might be imagined, but such as transfused through the soul the deepest melancholy, said, Creatures of clay, I receive you into mine empire. You are numbered amongst my adorers. Enjoy whatever this palace affords, the treasures of the pre-Adamite sultans, their bickering sabres, and those talismans that compel the dives to open the subterranean expanses of the mountains of Kath, which communicate with these. There, insatiable as your curiosity may be, shall you find sufficient to gratify it. You shall possess the exclusive privilege of entering the fortress of Ahaman and the halls of Argenk, where are betrayed all creatures endowed with intelligence and the various animals that inhabited the earth prior to the creation of that contemptible being whom ye denominate the father of mankind. Vathik and Naranahar, feeling themselves revived and encouraged by this harangue, eagerly said to the Geo, Bring us instantly to the place which contains these precious talismans. So at this point, they wander off to go and survey all that they have won through the, their endeavours. And they only begin to realise that perhaps something isn't quite right when they meet Solomon. Solomon, son of David. He tells them that he was cast down there or he is down there because of his iniquities in later life. So if you know the story of Solomon, in his youth he was wise and devoted to God. Um, he then married 300 women and had 700 concubines and they led him into the worship of idols. Um, and he goes on to explain that he was cast down for his iniquities in later life, but has hope unlike anyone else there. I do not remain, like the other inhabitants, totally destitute of hope. For an angel of light hath revealed that in consideration of the piety of my early youth, my woes shall come to an end, when this cataract shall forever cease to flow. Till then, I am in torments, ineffable torments, and unrelenting fire preys on my heart. Having uttered this exclamation, Solomon raised his hands towards heaven in token of supplication, and the caliph discerned through his bosom, which was transparent as crystal, his heart enveloped in flames. At a sight so full of horror, Naranahar fell back like one petrified into the arms of Vathak, who cried out with a convulsive sob, oh, Chio, whither hast thou brought us? Allow us to depart, and I will relinquish all thou hast promised. O oh, Mohammed, Remains there no more mercy? None. None, replied the malicious dive. No, o miserable prince. Thou art now in the abode of vengeance and despair. Thy heart also will be kindled, like those of the other votaries of Eblis. A few days are allotted thee previous to this fatal period. Employ them as thou wilt. Recline on these heaps of gold. Command the infernal potentates. Range at thy pleasure through the immense subterranean domains. No barrier shall be shut against thee. As for me, I have fulfilled my mission. I now leave thee to thyself. At these words, 
he vanished. Two quick notes there. Uh, my pronunciation of Naranaha might be wrong, so please correct me. And I went Yorkshire for the Gior because that's one of the few accents I can do because it is in fact mine. Um, <laughs> uh, born and bred in Yorkshire. Accent made weird by living in a lot of different countries. Um, so, as I mentioned, one of the things that we find here is this combination of Islamic uh, belief and mythology with Christian iconography. So you see these mentions, for example, of Afrit, a form of demon, and of course of Eblis, who, if I've understood correctly, is still a relatively debated figure. Um, not clear or not ultimately decided upon whether he's a jinn or a fallen angel, but here, quite clearly, the depiction of him as a youth with the, with the hair, with the blasted right hand, there is definitely appeal and an appeal here to the Christian iconography of Satan. In particular, I would argue the Miltonic version of Satan, um, blasted by the thunders of heaven, which you find in Paradise Lost. So I have mentioned as well that I would briefly talk about Orientalism. I'm not going to talk about it at length because it really isn't my area of, area of expertise and I'm not the best person um, to talk about it. I certainly don't have authority to talk about it. Um, I would recommend that you have a look at the work of other scholars. The obvious starting point there is Edward Said's Orientalism. But it's worth noting that what we find here in this Orientalist Gothic um, is not simply an unproblematic uh, celebration of other cultures. It is, of course, an exoticization and othering um, of um, Islamic beliefs, of Arabic cultures, and we need to be aware of that, of course, when we're reading. One of the interesting um, offshoots of that, I think, is what you quite often see in um, Gothic or Romantic uses of, uh, of an Arabic setting or as a, um, an Islamic character, is that you do find these continuing patterns of Christian discourse being forced upon them, whether it's iconography or whether it's, for example, in Talaba the Destroyer, um, the main protagonist is quite clearly um, has Protestant words stuffed right in his mouth to spout back out at us, the reader. Um, just one of the sort of interesting angles, and that's the bit that I am obviously a little bit more uh, confident talking about because um, my research is on theology, Protestant theology and the Gothic. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed reading it with me and that you are inspired to go away and read it for yourselves. Um, if you want um, demon football, if you want uh, your protagonist hiked over the back of a wife while they flee from tigers, if you want um, <laughs> people dwelling on clouds in little castles, if you want fake deaths, if you want one of the most exuberant uses of the supernatural in the early British Gothic um, after the Castle of Otranto, then this is probably the story for you. But as you can see as well, it's also got that, I think it's just fascinating and beautiful imagery that's going on. I love the depiction of hell and that idea of these hearts on fire burning ceaselessly and, and being through that method completely alienated from everybody around you as well. Love it. It's great. Um, so enjoy any comments, um, any recommendations for reading, pop them below and I really look forward to hearing from people. Goodbye.